Next, I'm going to talk about coccidioides. So coccidioides causes a disease colloquially known as valley fever. Whether it's caused by coccidioides imitis or posidaceae, this really depends on the location where the animal is, um, but the clinical manifestation is very similar. Subclinical infections are extremely common, and this can be actually up to 70% of dogs who are infected with coccidioides. There have been zero surveys done and found uh, animals with no clinical signs are serologically positive. The clinical signs associated with valley fever really depend on the site of infection and can mirror a wide variety of diseases. So lameness is perhaps most common. We can have animals who just have chronic illness, chronic nonspecific signs, respiratory signs, lymphadenopathy, or chronic non-healing cutaneous lesions. So a wide variety of presentations. This is a disease, again, that's associated with uh, the southwestern region of the United States, Tucson and Phoenix, Arizona are the regions with the highest incidence. And in this image here, you can see a picture of uh, the desert surrounding Tucson. We commonly see infections following a period of heavy rainfall. Um, epidemics have actually occurred or large outbreaks have occurred um, following dust storms that occur after rain. We have that mycelial phase growing in the soil when the conditions are right. And then when it dries out and the wind picks up, those anthrocanidia can be picked up and easily aerosolized by the wind. Remember the geographic distribution of coccidioides um, and remember to ask about travel histories. So many people in Western Canada are snowbirds. They fly south for the winter and they bring their animals with them. So we can see coccidioidomycosis here in Saskatchewan or other parts of Western Canada um, in, in our patients as well. Really important to know that this disease can have a very long incubation period. So animals with exposure in the last three years are potentially at risk. Valley fever is treated most commonly with either amphotericin B, fluconazole, or itraconazole. In the image on the left, you can see a dog with coccidioidomycosis. Um, this dog is weak, emaciated, it has a chronic disease, um, and it was found to also have bony lesions on uh, more detailed evaluation. On the right, we have cytology of thoracic fluid from a different dog, and this is the same image I showed before. You can see these large spherules. This is really the uh, diagnostic finding. It can also cause respiratory tract infections. So on the left, you can see granulomatous pneumonia in a llama. Um, it does have a broad host range. And then on the right, you can see a coccidioides imitis spherule um, on canine lung cytology. So perhaps collected by a transtracheal wash or bronchoalveolar lavage. In cats, coccidioidomycosis oftentimes manifests on the skin. In one study of cats with coccidioidomycosis, 43% of them presented with cutaneous lesions. Other common signs include inappetence, weight loss, respiratory signs, lameness, and very infrequently fever, so only 8% of cats. Histoplasma capsulatum is a fungus that causes disseminated disease. And again, it causes a wide range of nonspecific signs. Depression, weight loss, and fever are the most common clinical signs. And again, think about situations where the animal is unresponsive to antibiotics. So maybe they've been treated by their referring vet multiple times and just have not gotten better. In addition, in dogs, we commonly see diarrhea due to histoplasma enteritis. This is frequently a large bowel diarrhea with mucus and frank blood, so affecting the colon, but we also can see histoplasma um, causing infections in the small bowel as well. Dogs can have hepatomegaly, splenomegaly, and also icterus. In this image here, you can see granulomatous lymphadenitis. So here are all of these lymph nodes. Um, these are the lymph nodes of the mesentery of the small intestine of a dog with histoplasmosis. And I think it's important to think about the pathophysiology of granulomatous enteritis. So extensive lesions in the small bowel can result in a protein-losing enteropathy, which can lead to weight loss and sort of an emaciated condition of affected animals. In dogs, pulmonary histoplasmosis may be self-limited, although therapy is always recommended to prevent dissemination. 
Um, antifungals should be selected really based on the site of infection. So amphotericin B, itraconazole have both been used. In this image here, you can see cytology of a canine lymph node with histoplasma capsulatum, all these nice little organisms uh, down here. Cats are very susceptible to histoplasma. This is the second most commonly reported systemic mycoses in cats. Uh, most of them have disseminated disease, again, with nonspecific signs, depression, weight loss, fever, anorexia, lymphadenopathy, um, and skin lesions are quite common. So we can see nodules or ulcers. Uh, respiratory involvement also occurs commonly, although they don't frequently cough. So we may see dyspneic to kypneic animals or animals with abnormal lung sounds. Frequently, we also see ocular involvement. So approximately 25% of cats um, can have ocular lesions associated with uh, tissue swelling. In these images here, um, you can see feline lungs uh, with histoplasmosis. So clearly very abnormal, these sort of multifocal uh, lesions all throughout the lung. And then on the right, we actually have a cat's eye. And what I want you to appreciate here is that um, not only do we have corneal edema, but the eye has this large swelling coming out this side. Um, so swollen lesions in and around the eye, frequently seen with histoplasma in cats. In these images here, uh, we have a, a cutaneous draining tract in a dog with histoplasmosis. And then again, just to reemphasize the value of cytology, um, we have an impression smear made from a granulomatous mass with this nice cluster of histoplasma clearly visible in the middle. The sporothric Schenkii complex most often presents as a lymphocutaneous disease. And this is one that we can see in a wide variety of animals. Um, in horses, we commonly see nodules at the site of infection. And eventually those nodules um, and the cutaneous lymphatics sort of in the presence of those nodules ulcerate. We get exudation of yellowish kind of fluid from those ulcers, um, and they're chronic and non-healing. Disseminated disease can develop if these sort of more localized lesions aren't treated, and the disease occurs following damage to the skin from typically contaminated plant materials, so thorns for instance. Here you can see uh, ulcerative dermatitis caused by sporothric schenchii in a horse, so multiple uh, cutaneous nodules. I think you can maybe appreciate that we have raised lymphatics kind of connecting out each of those lesions. Treatment can be with either systemic iodine preparations or itraconazole. In cats, we're seeing the emergence of sporothrix brasiliensis. Um, it again causes most commonly cutaneous infections, um, and that can be really anywhere on the body. So the face, uh, the paws, the limbs, etc. Other signs that we can see include respiratory signs, so sneezing, nasal discharge, difficulty breathing, lymphadenopathy, and potentially even lesions of the bone. Sporothrix brasiliensis is an important zoonosis. Um, it's not one that we yet see endemic in North America. So at present, it's found in South America. The hotspot is really in Brazil, I believe around Rio de Janeiro, but it has been found in other South American countries as well. And I'll share some uh, reports from both Argentina and Chile. So here we have some really severely affected cats uh, from an outbreak in Argentina. Um, again, lesions on the nose, the limbs, the paws, and a very, very severe locally extensive lesion on the head. And then in this very recent report from just 2023, um, there was an outbreak of Sporothrix brasiliensis in domestic cats in Chile. You can see in images A, B, D, and F, the initial presentation of these animals, so severe lesions on the head, paws, um, maybe some crusting around the eyes, and then resolution of these uh, infections following therapy. Here we have an image of Sporothrix seen on cytology from feline skin, and again, you can just see these nice little sort of ovoid yeast-shaped organisms all throughout. In people, sporothrix schenkii complex infections are primarily associated with plant material, at least primarily in the southern United States and into Mexico. Uh, sphagnum moss, rose bushes, and splinters are sort of number one. Um, increasingly, we are seeing the emergence of sporothrix brasiliensis, 
Um, this is one that is zoonotically acquired from cats, typically through bites and scratches. Um, as of now, so November 2023, it is geographically limited to South America. Human infections start as small painless pustules, and then you get multiple linearly placed secondary pustule, pustules, so sort of along the lymphatics. That's how the organism tends to spread. In this image here, you can see just a couple of examples of what this can look like. So small ulcerative cutaneous lesions um, on this person's arm and finger, or potentially ocular lesions um, in people who have disseminated disease. Samples to collect when you suspect these organisms. Uh, for blastomyces, coccidioides, and histoplasma, there are some fantastic uh, ELISA-based methods that can be done to detect uh, antigens of these organisms. Um, interestingly, they're very readily identifiable from the urine, particularly for blasto and coccidioides. We can also look at fluid from any kind of draining skin lesions, try and identify those organisms cytologically, lymph nodes, um, or aspirates of other lesions, transtracheal washes or bronchoalveolar lavages if we have uh, respiratory involvement, and potentially cerebral spinal fluid in cases where we have neurological signs. For sporothrichschenkii complex, tissue biopsies or exudates from lesions are best collected. For blastomyces dermatitidis, serology is really number one, and it's antigen detection in the urine. We can identify this organism cytologically or through histopathology as well. For coccidioides immatis, histo, cytology, and again, serology, antigen detection in either the serum or urine. And the same thing for histoplasma capsulatum. For sporothrichschenkii, cytology and histopathology are really most important. Culture of all of these organisms is possible, but it's not recommended because when they're in their mycelial phase, at least blastomyces, coccidioides, and histoplasma are biocontainment level three. So high containment facilities are required in order to work with these safely. And if you suspect that these organisms are present in one of your patients, make sure to tell the diagnostic lab so that they work with your sample safely. The urine antigen tests are done by a commercial uh, fee-for-service lab in the United States called MiraVista Diagnostics. I don't have any sort of stake in MiraVista Diagnostics. Um, they just provide a service that I know is very useful for both uh, human and veterinary infectious diseases. For anyone dealing with an infection with a dimorphic fungus um, and needing some diagnostics, I would encourage you to check out their website. They have a lot of information there about um, which samples to collect, what type of uh, tube to store them in, and how much they need. Animals with blastomyces, coccidioides, or histoplasma infections are not terribly contagious. This isn't a disease that tends to transmit between individuals. It's really environmentally acquired. That yeast phase that's growing within the patient is not something that really readily spreads between individuals. They are, however, dangerous when cultured. So we don't want to be uh, growing these organisms potentially in their mycelial phase in a diagnostic lab. Sporothrix can be zoonotic via scratches or bites. Um, this is an organism with a broad host range and transmission associated with bites or scratches from certainly cats, but also mice, armadillos, squirrels, and dogs has been reported. I don't have any new terms today, but I do have a couple of questions for self-assessment. Mm -hmm.